Um, you know, we're, we're using all of our we care principles and our we care standards um, to to raise these animals with the utmost respect and the utmost um, importance and guidance and, and doing all the right things. And we, we can't be afraid to share that. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Jeanette Merritt, who's the Director of Communications at Indiana Pork Producers. How are you today, Jeanette? I'm good. Thank you for having me today. Well, we're glad to have you on today. Um, before we really start talking about the topic at hand, I'm going to have you do just a couple of quick moments here to introduce yourself a little bit more to our audience. I am the Director of Communications for Indiana Pork. I'm in my eighth year here. Uh, I have a, a great opportunity to work with our pig farmers all around Indiana and our consumer audience. Uh, it's a fun job. Uh, there's a lot of stresses, but it's fun because my husband and I are also fourth generation pig farmers. Uh, we farm with my family um, on our farm in north central Indiana. We are a farrow to finish operation. We do also have some contract barns. Uh, there's a dad, an uncle, a cousin, and my husband uh, who all work together. So the, the fun and the challenges of farming as a multi-generational family. Uh, we are raising, uh, hopefully, uh, the fifth generation that will want to come back to the farm. Uh, we currently have a freshman at Purdue um, who is studying agriculture. Uh, we have a sophomore or a junior in high school, a daughter um, who's 16, and a 12-year-old son. Um, and all of them want to be involved in ag. Uh, my son seems to think he's going to go play professional baseball first, and then he'll come home and farm. So I, I think he might be a little misguided, um, but uh, I, I think one of them will return to the farm um, and, and continue on that tradition. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. It sounds like you're certainly busy in the household. Very busy. Um, <laughs> well, I think this is really a great opportunity for us to visit. And as you're talking about raising that next generation, I think where I want to really start with this is is this communication piece. How do we tell our story? Um, because clearly you're you're doing that not only with your children, but in your in your job day to day. And so let's talk maybe first about you know, what are some things you're seeing in terms of communicating with producers? And then I think we'll talk a little bit about the consumer as well. So um, what are some key pieces that we would like our our producers to be thinking about in terms of communication today? I have to say it's so important that that our farmers tell their story. Um, I'm a storyteller by nature. My first career was as a farm broadcaster. And so I love the opportunity to go out and talk to our farmers. And then I want to tell everybody about the great things uh, that our farmers are doing. Uh, by nature, our farmers are not people who really want to wave their hand and say, look at what we're doing on the farm. It is the humblest group of people. Um, on the planet. They just they do the work, um, you know, day in, day out, do the hard work, participate in their community, uh, give back, help feed people at their food pantry, uh, but don't really want anybody to pay attention or don't want to raise too much awareness of what's going on on the farm. The problem with that is, um, is that the animal rights groups are now creating a narrative for us. Um, so they are creating the story, um, and I use story loosely, of what they want uh, people to know um, that they they want people to believe that's happening on the farm. And if we don't, as an ag community, stand up and start telling our story, it's it's going to get worse. Um, and so I really applaud, you know, if you if whatever social channel you're on, you can find um, some of those farmers who are out there trying to make inroads that are trying to tell their story that aren't afraid um, to stand in the hog barn and take a picture of the baby pigs coming off the semi that, you know, maybe their contract barn uh, just got turned and they, you know, everything's um, ready for that new batch of pigs to come in and, and they film those pigs coming in and show the care that they take of, of putting those animals into pens and feeding them. And, um, or, you know, in some cases, uh, I, I always use the example um, a few years ago at my house um, on our barn, uh, the power went out in our home and the house got down to about 50 degrees. Um, so I ran out to the hog barn where there are generators, um, unlike the house, and the barn was a lovely 78 degrees. Um, and so I, you know, the kids were all bundled up. We took pictures in the barn about how much warmer it was in the barn than it was in our house. Um, and people were amazed by that. They couldn't believe that, you know, the house was cold and why don't you heat your house first? Well, we can go out to the barn and stay warm. The things are our livelihood. And as farmers, we, we have to start telling that story. Um, it's, it's important that we communicate our message. We're not doing anything that the public shouldn't see in those barns. Um, you know, we're, we're using all of our we care principles and our we care standards um, to 
to raise these animals with the utmost respect and the utmost um, importance and guidance and, and doing all the right things. And we, we can't be afraid to share that. Um, we have to be ready uh, for someone who's going to have questions and, and someone who may um, want to know more. Um, and that's fine. You know, ex explain to people what's going on. Um, but, but we can't be afraid to be the ones to tell that story. <laughs> so what do you find to be the most effective way to tell that story? You mentioned social media. Um, I know we have a lot of producers that, that do donate to food pantries and so forth. And sometimes that gets announced, right? If there's a pancake and sausage supper, we'll see the announcement of who donated the hog for sausage. But how do we, how do we get beyond maybe our local community and, and expand that reach? I mean, I know some people even within our local community probably need some education, but what's the most effective ways that you find to communicate that story? I'll start in our community um, because I do think you make changes first at home and then you then you start making those changes on a broader basis. Um, I am a huge proponent of however you can give back to your community. Um, pays off in the long run, especially uh, being kind to your neighbors, uh, being, um, you know, educating your neighbors on what's going on in those barns. Um, we do a big thing here in Indiana with our board of directors uh, where we encourage them um, to donate ground pork or donate a ham product um, around the Christmas or Thanksgiving season to their local food pantry. Um, started this because if we think back to the pandemic um, and what happened to those food pantries, it wasn't just people in the community that were standing in those food pantry lines. All of a sudden it was people, it was our neighbors, it was people we knew um, who had never had to utilize a food pantry before. And so our farmers, you know, took the opportunity to have a pig process and donate a couple hundred pounds of ground pork to their food pantry. And that, you know, they do it quietly because, again, you know, that's just the group of people they are. We're going to be humble about it. But I've kind of forced my board to um, tell me about it, take pictures so I can kind of blow it up and, you know, share it on social media and really pat them on the back and explain farmers feed the world. And we said that for years. And, you know, that's that's great. But the world is big. And for a lot of people, the world is far away. Um, over the past three years, people want to know that we're feeding our neighbors. And when we look at farmers feeding their neighbors um, and how they're giving back into their food pantries and what they're doing with their communities, be it like you said, a pancake, a pancake breakfast or um, something like that, um, you know, that makes a huge difference. That really does impact people. And, you know, people like county commissioners and county councils kind of remember those things. Um, and so when, when ordinance comes before them or questions, you know, they can think, well, I need to go ask somebody who knows about this, you know, and then they make the phone call uh, to the local farmer and, and ask for some of their input and guidance on that. If we think about how to do that bigger, um, I will say social media. And um, I say that as someone who has not created a TikTok account yet. Um, I, I need to, but there's a lot of farmers out there who are doing a really good job. Um, so Indiana Pork does not yet have TikTok, um, but I'm being, I'm, I'm being encouraged to look at it. Um, so there's, there are some really good farmers who are out there um, really taking the opportunity to show uh, what's going on on the farm, and they do get attacked. Um, if you read some of the comments, if you read um, people who have their thoughts on it, and they're not, a, they don't back down. They're not afraid to say, "Hey, this is why you're not right," and this is here's the actual fact. And you know, as farmers, we have to not be afraid to take that camera um, and just show what's going on. I've, you know, I've taken, you know, to Facebook or Instagram in my own barn, and you know, shown the baby pigs, shown what's going on, that why we have farrowing crates and, you know, tried to explain the difference between a two pound baby pig and a 400 pound sow. And when it comes from our farmers, I think to explain it um, to their social media following, um, I think people listen and they really, you know, they'll pay attention. And it's just a matter of stepping out of our comfort zone a little bit and not being afraid um, to maybe take a bigger step to help, to help share our story in that bigger space. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. That hesitancy around people making comments. And I think it's something, you know, I, I do follow different TikToks and I don't have an account either. Um, but I like to to watch some of the agricultural ones to see what people are posting and, and review the comments to just kind of gauge where a consumer is and their knowledge and, and the questions and curiosity that they have. And and so when our, our farmers are, are thinking about getting involved in that way, what might be some things that they want to consider to maybe reduce some of those potential negative things that they're worried about. First time go watch somebody who's doing it well. And you can, you know, you can start Googling people on social media or farmers or agriculture on social media 
and find some of the accounts who who answer those questions well. There's there's some great pig pig farmer accounts. There's some really great dairy ones as well. Uh, both of those livestock industries tend to get you know their fair share of um, the activists who who come after us and you know with their narrative that um, they want to troll everything that gets done. Um, so I encourage watch the people who are doing it first um, and see how they address it. And then when you start thinking about the story you want to tell, you know, frame your frame your story. Um, take a look around your barn and you know look at what your day to day, um, how it's outlined, you know, and just share that. I mean, people, I'm I think there's still the ideological that like farmers are leaving at eight o'clock and then they come home for the lunch and I mean, and you know then they're all wrapped up by five o'clock and you know put a bow on it. The day's done. Um, and for most farmers, that's definitely not how any day looks. Um, every day is different. And so I think it's always encouraging to to walk through the day and to explain all of the different roles a farmer plays on their farm um, from, you know, veterinarian sometimes to, you know, food scientists and, um, you know, the, all, all sorts of different things that, that a farmer does um, and explain that. Uh, I think agriculture also sometimes um, is considered a career that you don't have to be very smart to do, and and I we can very easily dissuade people um, on that when you start explaining what goes into this job. Um, as far as dealing with um, people's questions, um, I think there's always you can always tell the people who have no interest in learning anything. They're just there to spout off um, an agenda. Um, there and then there's people who are firmly in your corner, like they believe every. They love everything you do. The people who have questions, I call them kind of the movable middle. Um, So those are the folks that, you know, they they need information. They're very interested. They want to learn more. Um, Maybe they don't know a thing, um, but they're interested in what you have to do. And they have genuine questions. And so being able to not spend a whole lot of time on the activists because you'll just run yourself into the ground and end up with a giant headache. Um, But when the people, when when your viewers come with real questions and have, you know, real comments, um, working with those folks, I think, is where we can have the big impact. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and I think too, one thing if you're not very comfortable working in that that realm is consider participating in an Operation Main Street or something like that that can give you some social media training or some comfort in how you communicate with the public. You bet. Um, we certainly have some resources both at state level and, and national level that could help them. They do, and I think um, you know for farmers who might be involved in India or their farm bureaus, I think. Um, uh, American Farm Bureau has done some of that social media training. I know sometimes the states do as well. Um, different agricultural organizations provide that. So there's plenty of what uh, possibilities out there for you to learn. So there's never an excuse of, I don't have anywhere to go learn it um, that, that you can use. You, there's always some place where you can find the knowledge. Absolutely. One of the things that came to mind as you were talking there is, well, you said we can show all kinds of different aspects when we're in the barns or just outside the barns. But What's the consumer most interested in knowing about it? If you visited with the consumer in your state, what what would be something that they're most curious that we're doing at the farm level? I think the biggest problem for pig farms is that we don't look as pretty as cattle farms. Um, if you drive by a pasture, you see cows laying around the field. They're just dozing, usually doing nothing or, you know, licking each other. I don't know. You know, just they look cute. Cows are cows are adorable. Um, I think pigs are adorable too. However, when you drive by a hog barn, you can't see them. I mean, you see white walls. I mean, you have no idea what's going on on that farm. So automatically, it looks like we're not welcoming people, or we're not as welcome as a cattle as a pasture because they can't see those animals. Um, so I think people want to know what's going on inside the inside the barn walls, um, and they just want to trust us. And so being able to show that. You know, we take our biosecurity measures, you know, here's, here's the shower that we're using before we, before we enter the barn. Here's this new set of clothes we're now putting on. Um, here's our employees. Um, here's, here's all the families that, you know, are involved in working on our operation, be it by blood or people who just work there forever, um, that, you know, that we consider family. Um, and here's all the precautions we're taking in these barns. Um, taking them through, you know, farrowing, um, you know, watching those baby pigs being born. Um, I don't care if, like you don't like anything about livestock production. There's something about an animal being born. That's just pretty magical. Um, you know, it's like a human, human being born is magical. I, I love watching baby pigs being born. It's just, you know, it's just a cool thing. It's life coming into the world. Um, so, you know, showing that and then 
being able to show the immediate care that our farmers then start taking with those animals, grabbing a baby pig, wiping it off, making sure it's, um, it's getting its nutrition as soon as it needs it. And if there's something wrong, um, then how are we going to take care of that baby pig? You know, what, what steps do we need to do to make sure that um, the pig is going to survive? Um, those types of things, I just think, I just think consumers just want to trust us. Um, they're told not to. And, you know, the, the activists are out there saying that they shouldn't trust us, that we're doing evil, bad things in those barns. And um, we're not. And so just being able to show here's what's going on inside of the barn and here's the trust um, that consumers can have in us, I, I think is really what they want to know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think it goes beyond just animal care, right? It's, it's sustainability. So yes, we do nutrient management plans and this is how we think about what we're doing to the environment. And this is how we're trying to save water or, um, you know, antibiotic use of course has been a, a big topic for a while, but, and I've seen a few TikToks on that too. This is why we give an antibiotic or this is when we decide to do it. And I think, again, that kind of answers those big questions that people are curious about. And they've, they've definitely heard incorrect information along the way, particularly around environmental sustainability and what we do with our resources. And I think that's important too, right? I just uh, heard a podcast a few days ago that caused me to start screaming at my radio while I was driving in the car, um, driving home from work, uh, that involved a very famous actress, um, and whatever big platform she's decided to get herself on uh, that was bashing pig farming so bad. And boy, my head was spinning. And um, she was talking about um, how pig farmers, uh, in her view, just take all this manure and we just spray it everywhere and we spray it at people's houses and we're, we're causing all the neighbors to die and we're, we're horrible people. And oh my goodness, I, I, I don't think I have any way to get to this very famous actress. I did start tweeting at her, um, but didn't do any good but you know when I look at that type when I as I was listening to that and I was screaming at my radio while she was wrong um you know that's the type of misinformation is out there um and that's you know when you have these people that are spreading all this stuff you know it just grinds on you um it makes me realize that we always have a job um there's you know anybody involved um in agriculture always has a job to communicate and however we can however we can help um re-guide people uh, and educate them, um, there, there is always, always a need because there's always people out there who are, who are very miseducated and misguided. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good point. I'll have to find that podcast. I'm actually now interested as to who that might be. You might yell at your radio too. <laughs> I might yell. That's right. That's okay. So what, so let's kind of switch it a little bit. We've been talking about the consumer in a way of how we educate, but in your role as the as the director of communications, what are some stories and messages that you're trying to share uh, with the consumer? And what consumer are you currently targeting? I guess within your state, right? What does a state pork producers association look at for their consumer audience? I will say we do skew heavily towards female um, because they are the decision maker in the home. Still, um, they are the ones that are going to the grocery store, um, spending their income. Uh, we hope on you know pork chops and bacon and and taking it home. Uh, bacon is not a hard sell um, that is uh, that's the gateway um, to everybody for pork and so uh, we do we do have to educate people that not all pork is unhealthy just because bacon you probably shouldn't eat two pounds of bacon in one sitting um, you can have some um, but maybe not all of it um, at once um, so there is always an education on um, how healthy pork is for people and so when we look at who we're, who we're targeting we are targeting um, the people who are spending money in the grocery store um, as a as Indiana pork, um, we we're not encouraged. We we have shifted our marketing efforts a little bit in the past few years, where we did spend a lot of time working with um, food companies and encouraging people to go in and and order pork on the menu. Um, I still spend a lot of time with chefs, um, local chefs, uh, maybe independent chefs, um, and because I think the work that they're doing in their restaurants is incredibly important, and we. We want to support their efforts in putting pork on the plate and um, and the the audience that they have coming into their restaurants. We we use chefs for a lot of different events. We have some outstanding in chefs in Indiana, James Beard winners and all sorts of award winners. And um, so I love working with them. I love seeing the creative ways that they use, they use pork. I know we want consumers to eat there, but our efforts really have shifted our messaging to trust the farmers to that consumer. Um, so. I won't, I don't say I don't, I don't have a certain age range that I'm reaching. Uh, my message is spread to everybody. 
um, but it is it really is aimed at uh, the the grocery shopper, probably a mom um, that that kids at home that that are um, driving their kids around to practices after you know after school or heading to a game on the weekend and encouraging them when they when they hit the grocery store that that pork was somewhere on their menu because they trust what we're doing on the farm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Well, you mentioned kids, and and you are of course in the middle of raising your own next generation, and and that's one piece that I think is really important. A couple of years ago, I heard a statistic, and I never really thought about it, but there's a change in the way we buy food. So when I was growing up, you ate whatever your mom put on the table, and that was the way it was. Um, and somebody said the other day, well, or a couple of years ago now, that it's no longer that. It's the parents are buying what the children want to eat in the grocery store. And that actually kind of surprised me. I thought, well, actually, I guess I do do that before I go to the store. I ask the kids what sounds good to them. And so how do we address that next generation, right? Because it's better to start young, especially if they're influencing what mom is buying at the grocery store. So are you targeting the youth in any way to try to encourage them to, you know, at least understand pork production and and get interested in in what we're doing? Well, when I ask my kids what they want at the grocery store, I always get the same thing. Hey, mom, can you make meatloaf? Um, That's that's like the, uh, the, the thing that they would eat every week if I would put it on the put it on the menu every week. Um, I, I spend some time working with our high schools, um, in our family and consumer science classes, um, the, the old home ec, um, that some of us grew up with where they taught you how to sew and cook, um, in school. Uh, I, I think it's important to start reaching those age groups. You know, that's the high school age, sometimes eighth grade, um, depending on the school setup. And I'll take presentations into those classrooms where I'll start by educating them on how pigs are raised. And then I'm going to teach them how to cook something. Um, pork burgers are really fun um, for high school classes to cook, um, and it's easy for them. Um, so we want to make sure that those kids have the opportunity to taste pork. Um, sometimes, you know, not everybody has the same means at home, or you know, you're not, you know, people are eating different things in their home. Um, so we want to make sure that they know how to cook pork, um, and that it will help influence them as they, you know, get into college or whatever. Um, trade school or whatever the next step is um, after they leave high school by working with those um, family consumer science classes, educating them first about the farm and why we raise pigs, how we raise pigs. Um, it's it's always amazing to me uh, the questions you get. Um, they're still even at that age, and you know you're hearing they're hearing it from their parents. Well, how come those pigs are in barns? Don't we raise pigs outside? And um, don't those pigs want to eat grass? And um, no, they don't. They they really they really love corn and soybean based diet. Um, and so it's it's always fun to work with the high school kids because you get a whole different set of questions. Um, and, uh, but you get a, a whole bunch of like eyes that are kind of wide open um, after they learn about raising pigs. And then once they cook it and they realize this isn't that hard and I could go home and I could go home and do this. And maybe I could ask my parents to go buy it at the grocery store. Um, so I enjoy working with the high school classes. It's, it's a lot of fun to, to head into those schools and, and do a little work with them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great one. So when we think about giving back to the community, you know, offering to come in and do that is certainly a great opportunity. Um, we also did one um, in our community with a, a little book that that's written on you know how pigs are raised, and we'd go in and read that to the school aged children, the youth, yeah. or you could do it during a, a library Saturday, right when they have somebody come in and read a book. Yeah. You could easily volunteer your time as a farmer to say, "Hey, here I am. I'm going to read you this book, and you can ask me questions about yeah. how I take care of pigs." And so. I think there's lots of great opportunities, but I do like that with the, with the high schoolers, getting them involved in cooking, right? Doing something with their hands and, and being engaged in that way really does trigger some good conversation. I'm sure. They never realize they like pork burgers because they've probably never had one. They've had hamburgers and they know they like a good hamburger. So um, when they eat a pork burger, they're like, oh, this is similar. And it is the season for ag days. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, as we, as we are kind of around national ag week and national ag day, um, there's tons of schools out there that have Ag Day celebrations or counties or communities. And so we do a lot of work there, too. Typically, I'm um, in the elementary age where uh, you see kindergartners or fourth graders that are heading to their FFA petting zoo. And, um, you know, they, they want someone to come and educate them on pork. So uh, we'll go and we'll go and do those. We'll supply all sorts of fun things for those ag groups um, or, you know, we'll work to connect a farmer um, in those areas if, if they need some help there. So um I, I love the chance to educate the kids. Um, it, it's fun. It's fun to uh, already see what misconceptions uh, they have about farming. And uh, when their brains aren't even fully developed yet, 
um, that, you know, they still have all these misconceptions and, uh, and how, and work to kind of, um, educate them on, on the, on the correct way that we are doing things. Absolutely. Well, Jen, I see our time is kind of wrapping up and, and I really have enjoyed this. And I think we could talk certainly a lot longer to, to help give our audience some different ideas and tips on how to communicate with others. But could you maybe summarize in a couple of key points what you'd like our, our uh, listeners to think about today when they, they walk away from our podcast? Uh, I think, you know, my, my major point is, and I tell this to all of my farmers, is don't be afraid to tell your story. I mean, if you don't tell your story, someone else is going to. And it may be scary. It may be scary to turn that camera around and put your face on the camera and you don't want anybody to see you. Or you might say, the, you know, maybe you'll get your words all fumbled up or backwards. Nobody cares. Um, it, it is absolutely imperative. Uh, that that you tell your story, um, that you be responsible for your own narrative, um, and share what you're doing on the farm because people want to know. Uh, you can you know follow follow all the social media folks that are kind of out there trying it right now. Uh, get your feet wet and and tell your story. And if you need help, there's plenty of places where you can learn um, that'll that'll help you walk you through it. Um, and if you're in Indiana, I always tell my farmers, I'll help you. I'll do whatever whatever it is that you need to to get you. Um, to tell your story, but I think it's absolutely imperative that that we tell um, our story and not let others do it for us. Perfect. It's time for our famous three. Well, as you know, one of the things we like to do before we let you go is ask our guest speakers a couple of different questions. Um, the first one I really have for you is around a swine resource. Is there a, a go-to resource, some type of recommendation you would have for our listeners today that, that you might use as well? Well, if they're in Indiana, I hope they would call the Indiana pork producers. Um, that would be my first resource. Um, I'd, I'd be bad if I didn't be a little self-serving and say, uh, I hope that we are a go-to for our, you know, nearly 3,000 big farmers in the state. Um, and if, if they're not in Indiana, then I hope they call the National Pork Board or their own state pork organization, um, because every every state has uh, pigs being produced um, in, in all of our states, and there are um, resources, organizations, um, there are some states that kind of combine their pork organizations or work it through their um, Department of Agriculture. But um, I, I do hope people uh, value the state organization, um, Indiana or National Pork Board, um, for information when they need it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's great resources on those web pages for sure. Even some good recipes, too, I found. There are some so. good recipes. <laughs> Always great opportunities to check those out. How about something that's not related to pork? Is there a book that you read recently that you would like to share with the group that could be fictional, could be self-help, anything that you, you've read that you'd like to share? So if you saw my nightstand um, next to my bed, I, I honestly have 12 or 13 books like stacked up there right now. I need like a year-long vacation um, to get them all read. Um, but I did just buy one. It is, it's on the top of the pile. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I'm hoping I can start it this weekend. Um, and it has nothing to do with pork production, but everything I think to do with um, life. It's by Sister Jean, um, who is the nun um, with the Loyola men's basketball team. Um, so when Loyola made their final four appearance back in 2018, um, it was like a Cinderella story. And my family, we are huge, huge basketball people. Um, we love we love Purdue men's basketball and women's basketball. Um, so this book is pretty appropriate. Um, but she, Sister Jean became famous for being like the little old nun who was sitting in her wheelchair beside the team. And she scouts for them. Um, she like writes scouting reports before every game. And now she's like this huge, so she had a bobblehead. And so she wrote a book um, called uh, Wake Up With Purpose, um, Things I Learned in My First Hundred Years. So she's now 103 years old, still goes to work every day. Um, and I thought, I'm I'm not even near 103 and I haven't written a book yet. So um, I feel very behind and I really can't wait to read her book. I think it's, I think it's going to be really great. So um, I haven't read it yet, um, but I, I think it's going to be pretty good. Yeah. I, I remember that in 2018, yeah. the whole discussion around her. I didn't realize she wrote a book. So that yep. actually sounds really fun to read. Just came out. So I'm excited to read it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, the last question we'd like to ask Jeanette is really around uh, if you can think of somebody in your life that you defined as successful and success is however you want to define it, what trait did they have or do they have that you think has allowed them to be successful? So two of the biggest people in my life were uh, my grandparents um, and they, they started our family farm. Um, both of them um, have passed away, my grandma not too uh, recently, 
ago. Um, but they were the hardest working people I knew. Um, and absolutely just would and they never complained about anything. And when I started my career, um, as an intern, my grandma looked at me and, uh, you know, giving me the life advice that the grandparents do. And she said, never be above any job or any task in your job. She said, there is nobody who's above doing anything, no matter what your title is. Um, and I always got a kick. I mean, that always is played in the back of my head. Um, my first internship in college, um, I had to dress. I was interning for the Indiana Soybean Alliance, um, and I had to dress like a soybean um, in the soybean mascot costume and march around our Indiana State Fairgrounds in 95 degree weather. Um, and it was miserable. Um, I had to do a radio interview with a farm broadcaster in that soybean costume. And when I was done, that farm broadcaster said, if you want a job next summer, call me, I'll hire you. And that, that led to my career because that next summer I took a job in radio. Um, and you know, never, so I completely think of my grandma telling me don't be above anything to wearing a swimming costume to launch in my career. And so the, it's that advice that, that kind of always plays in the back of my head that nobody's above anything. I and mean, you, you just do whatever, whatever needs done um, and, and get the job done. Um, no matter, I guess, no matter what it is. Yeah, no, that's a great story. That is absolutely great. Um, that, that is wonderful, Jeanette. And I, I do want to thank you again for your time today. Um, for our listeners, one more time, this is Jeanette Merritt, who is the communications director at Indiana Pork Producers. Jeanette, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven-week-long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.